I am not starting anything. Look at this mess. Leave it. I'll clear it up. I said I'll do it. Okay, okay. You're not doing your eyes any good wearing those shades in the house, you know. You should get your eyes checked, Lionel. Nah, just eye strain. Been working too hard, reading too much. And drinking too much? Drinking doesn't give you eye strain. I want Arthur to see this new painting. It's the most challenging thing I've attempted so far. I think it's going to be good. Mm. Well, I'm glad to hear that. You've been like a cat on hot bricks since you've started, covering it up like a baby when you're not in the studio. Mm. But Lina, why do you want to paint something so big? The thing barely fits in the studio. I did some work on it last night after they left. My God, Lionel. You mean to say you stayed up painting? I, 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 you want to kill yourself or what? It's not enough that you're always working or reading. Hanging up late every night? I... Well, what do you think, Pat? I'm calling it the robe of ancestors. You're asking the right one. I don't know a thing about art. What are those faces supposed to be? Your ancestors? They're ancestral icons. Ancestral who? Ancient masks, shapes representing gods and spirit of different cultures. These are Guyanese icons. They go back to our pre-Columbian past. You see, look at this background here. It's made up of all the primary colors, each shading into the other. That's something I learned in the interior. The Amerindians see color differently from us. The leaves in the rainforest aren't just green. The rivers aren't simply black or brown. Everything is subtle, changing even as you look. Well, what do you think of it? Oh, when art comes, you have to ask him. He's the art critic. Eddie and me could shake hands. We don't understand these intellectual things. Nothing intellectual about having an opinion. You and Eddie certainly don't have any problem with that, do you? No. If you don't like the painting, that's all you have to say. It's your opinion. I have to respect it. I didn't say I don't like it. But you don't really want my opinion. It's people like Otto you want to impress. Lionel, this isn't a masterpiece, man. It's a monster piece. You, you do this yourself? How long have you been working on this, Lionel? Why you kept it so secret? What you calling it? Robe of Ancestors. Robe of Ancestors, eh? But I must tell you, I think it's far superior to your couvert canvas. Yes, I know you're going to say that I'm biased, but this is, well, it's beyond surrealism. It's more down to earth, you know? It's larger than life, not just big, but more iconic, bold, bright colors, man. This painting makes a powerful statement about roots. Uh, I agree about the surrealism thing. No question about it. This isn't surreal. It, it's real, sir. Eddie, why you don't sit down and take the weight off your brain? 
I thought you talk, you talk. I go lie down here and enjoy my beer. Ah. Seriously, though, Lionel, this is powerful stuff you're dealing with. Not so vague and dreamy. The idea of a robe, the fabric constructed from the culture of our ancestors is, well, it's a great idea. Amerindian myths and so on are okay as fantasy. Boy, but we have to be concerned with the life of the folk, with roots. But I, I, I see you couldn't resist bringing in your Amerindian motifs. <laughs> uh, uh, what are these markings? Tamari? No. They're from the designs the YY use in their weaving and basket work. But the whole robe is a blend of motifs from Amerindian, African, Asian, Indian. <laughs> Still the same message, Elinel. The pluribus unum, out of the many, one. That old romantic American dream, a dream that doesn't include the black pluribus, of course. American? There's more than one America and more than one dream. Guyana should be the southernmost pole of that entire hammock of Caribbean islands slung between the three Americas. After you hear the man, Lionel Bai, <laughs> you don't know it, but you're a poet. So I am lying down in the hammock of the Caribbean islands. Nice man, nice. It's not an original metaphor. It's from a Derek Walcott poem. We live in the most diverse cultural region in the world. How can you ignore the incredible mixture of cultures we represent? I'm not saying we should ignore that fact, but we have to commit ourselves to the cultural base from which we all came. That base is Africa. We back to that same argument again. Is a painting man. Every work of art comes out of some social or cultural consciousness. That means there's a political attitude involved in just about- I am not interested in the politics of art or the art of politics. Why you think of the painting, Eddie? Book by, I ain't no art critic. But, but tell me though, was, what are all them faces supposed to be? Your ancestors? No, Eddie our ancestors. Now staring up into space like if they see spirits. <laughs> I would like to meet up with any of them on a dark night, ancestors or no ancestors. Of course, you know, Eddie doesn't believe in racial ancestry and racial memory. He thinks he was specially created. And God said, let there be light and dark and mulatto and dogla. Right, Eddie? <laughs> Very funny. But what's the use getting all worked up about ancestors when most of you don't even know who we grandfather was? Some of you don't even know who we father was. Speak for yourself, friend. Anyway, the painting is meant to reflect the variety of ancestors we all have. It's that mixture of cultures that can help us to develop a uniquely Guyanese culture, a unique Caribbean culture, why should we consider only the African culture as ours? That is what you seem to be saying. I never said anything of the sort. Look, which races represent the greatest number of people in the Caribbean region? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Y'all going back to this race business? Well, Lion, Lionel got on his sandals now. I'll you run your race around the block. I going for another beer. Africans and Indians, right? But let me tell you something. If Africans and Indians don't force respect and embrace their own cultures, learn about Mother Africa and Mother India, they will never come to terms with being Guyanese. They will always be rootless. Rootless? You mean bad minor without pity? Well, I, I don't know nobody, so you, Lionel? Not ruthless, Eddie. Rootless. Without cultural roots. Oh, -ho. So wait, Arthur, you, you think Guyanese Indians feel rootless? How much Indians tell you the man? You should talk to me, father. He would set you straight on that. Pandit Prasad, <laughs> your father is a Hindu holy man, Eddie. India is still real for him. 
because of his religious faith. That is why he can enter Guyanese political and social life without feeling the need to defend his cultural roots. That's why he could marry outside of the Hindu tradition. Arthur, let's leave my father-in-law out of discussion, this discussion, okay? Okay. But don't misunderstand me, Lionel. Are you, Eddie? I respect and admire your father. He's a progressive religious leader, and we all know that he has suffered from the narrow-mindedness of others, including the Hindu society. I'm only pointing out that his acceptance of his cultural base is what gives him the confidence to be committed to a vision of a unified Guyana. He has roots. Ah, oh, girl, you just in time. These two at it again. I I can get some more some more beers. <laughs> I was due to go on the statutory uh, three months uh, leave in the UK because uh, Queen's College uh, teachers were actually civil servants. So you had that facility. Um, the same year, Carifest was declared. So I had to make a decision whether to go to London and, and go about my favorite museums or to stay for Carifesta. Carifesto won because it would have been the first time for me to get to see uh, work from the Caribbean by artists. So I remained. Um, Philip Moore and Aubrey Williams were um, sponsored by the Carifesto committee to have one man exhibitions. I had not, no such thing in mind, but Bastil Hines, <laughs> who was my promoter, Vaseline said to me that I should have um, a one-man show as well. I said, I don't know how to go about that. So he said he would help. Um, so I duly went to the chairman, chairperson, uh, Lena Dalton, and said, you know, um, I would like to have a one-man show. And I'm wondering whether the Carifesto committee would sort of help me. And she said, no, because they already have Williams and uh, more to look after. So I said, thank you very much, but I will go ahead, still go ahead and have my exhibition. So I left. So like about a week later, the letter came saying that, yeah, that they're, they're gonna um, uh, uh, sponsor me to have a one-man show. But it was literally a one-man show because some of the facilities that should have been made available to me were not. And um, uh, Basil Hines sent um, a young man who did odd jobs to him to help me fix the show and stuff like that. So the young man came um, to open, the, the, had on his white shirt, his tie, neatly dressed, and he manned that door every day. I used to go and you know spend time there as well. But he did an amazing thing. Uh, he kept two books, I had them. He kept two exercise books like this which were filled, two of them, I have them both. And what he did was every single person who came to look at that show, he insisted that they write their name. He did that. He insisted they write their name 
um, they had to write a comment as well about the exhibition. And then they had to, to write which was the painting that they liked best. And he did that throughout the show. And, um, at, the end, at the end of the show, I had 8,717 visitors at the end of the show. One day at the exhibition, I saw him with a group of people standing in front of a piece of sculpture of mine. And the piece of sculpture was a work I called Amatuk, the name of a waterfall. It was, a, it was an abstract piece of work. And he said, he was telling the, the viewers that, um, that he knew this fall, this Amatuk Falls, because he had worked there. He was a pork knocker, he used to be a pork knocker. So he knew about the falls. And he was explaining how the water carves and shapes the rocks. He was doing that on his own, you know? So I said, you go ahead and do what you got to do. Um, on another occasion, I saw a grandmother, obviously coming from Border Market. And um, she stopped at the Freemasons Hall, which is where I had the exhibition. Um, so the grandmother came in and I saw her looking, stand looking and turning her looking at a collage I have done of, the, um, the, 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 of Carl Jung. And um, I said, I wonder what she's thinking about that. So I went to her, I said, um, can I help you? She said, yeah, she said, um, I said, I'm the person who did this. She said, yeah. She said, who is that man? It was that famous photograph of Young with the spectacles on his forehead. Yeah. And I said, his name is Carl Young. He is um, a psychologist and he has done a lot of work about dreams. She said, dreams? I said, yeah. She said, well, I have dreams every night. And the things that I dream about usually come true. I said, what? She said, yes. She said, it comes true. I get up, um, I go to bed, I sleep, I dream, then I get up in the morning and I pray and I go to my business. So we had a long conversation about dreams because that's one of my things as well. Burnham came, um, he didn't come at the opening because opening is filled with people and everybody will want to speak to him. He will not get a chance to look. So he came by himself and his uh, bodyguards, and he went around the exhibition and said things. And then he bought a piece of work, a um, piece of sculpture, which surprised me because normally he had bought paintings of mine. So he bought a piece of sculpture entitled uh, Columbus. And it's just an abstract sculpture. And so it was uh, um, Goodland, Arthur Goodland from uh, Booker's. He called me one day and said, Stanley, I have some pieces of elm wood, which came as ballast in a ship. Uh, you know, you know, I know, could you make use of it? I said, sure. And I took it because for one, elm was one of the woods used in shipbuilding in Europe. A year or two later, I was speaking to, um, to, to his wife, Viola Barnum, and she said, asked about the piece, and she said, it had been destroyed. And I said, what? She said, yes. <clears throat> she said, wood ants had taken over the piece and they, they noticed it too late. You know. 15 pieces, I would say easily 15 pieces. Yeah. Uh, they were a mixture of painting and sculpture. There were people who would return. Mm -hmm. Said a number of people who worked in the, in the city in Georgetown would come there during their lunch break. And some would return and bring friends with them as well. Yeah. Work, I went to see Aubrey's work which were his, um, his, his expressionist, abstract expressionist uh, pieces. Um, so it was good to see the actual pieces. And he, Aubrey was a sort of a bravura person kind of thing, you know. So the painting showed that, that, that aspect of his own character. Difficult people, people would go and look at Philip's work and have problems trying to understand, you know, what it was that Philip was getting at. And I, I can understand, I had that problem myself. But um, after a while, I came to realize that, that Philip actually was a very uh, a spiritual man. But instead of writing, he did his artwork to try to convey his ideas but he had very, very strong ideas about spirituality. You have to bear in mind as well that we did not have any specific 
art education uh, program in schools. Schools like Bishop's, St. Rose's, and uh, at one time St. Santos when I was there, we had art programs, but you did not have a general programs in art so that people did not understand what artists were saying. I mean, in schools, you, you, had, you had a literary education, you learned to read and write and to read books, but you did not have a visual education, a visual education, how to look at things, which would have included looking at artwork as looking at anything. Teachers should be trained specially in art education. We do not really have a, a, a Carib we talk about Caribbean culture, but what we're, what we're talking about is really uh, uh, pockets of culture. It's an insularity thing going on. The Trinidadians have their thing, Barbados, Jamaica, Cuba, Santo Domingo, Guyana, Suriname. They all have their, so it's, it's pockets, but there isn't an overarching or overriding uh, 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 aesthetic uh, um, ideas about what art is all about, uh, canons of, of art, and that is the rules that you that you examine when you're going to produce artwork. We do not have those things in place. So you, you, the, you, the artist, you are left up to your, your or your own individual mean to do those things. So you invent your own aesthetic, and you invent your own canons. And that puts you out of touch with the wider community because they don't understand what the hell is he doing? What, what is that all about? They don't understand that. Carifesto was actually trying to bring the, the work of the, the creative artists, drama, music, all the rest of it, um, to people, to let people understand what is taking place within their own uh, respective countries. The first Carifesto's um, Guyana, uh, Jamaica, Cuba, and Barbados, I think supported that idea. But afterwards, the Carifesto became an art fair. I remember Dennis Williams made a very, a very uh, um, cogent remark. He said that um, what we should do in the Caribbean is instead of having a single Carifesto every four years, every year we should have a Carifesto in one of the countries but that event should only concern one of the creative arts. So one year it might be uh, 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 the visual arts in, in Trinidad, the second year might be music in Barbados and so on. Fest festival arts would also have to include a number of, of um, debates, lectures on theory, and things like that. You know, what, what you're trying to say, what is the theory behind this? What canon or what specific rules or canons are you following? What is your particular? That should be part of Carifest. It's not. Naima, the great spirit, dwelt in the huge mountain top that throbbed and felt the swift black waters of Pataro's race. Pause on the lip, commit themselves to space and dive the half mile to the rocks beneath. Black 
were the rocks with sharp and angry teeth, and those rocks the eager waters died, lost their black body, and up the mountainside, above the gorge that seethed and foamed and hissed, rose, resurrected into lovely mist. The rock he lived in towered a half mile high so that it seemed a rival to the sky. And over it, this living mist he drew the curtain of divinity from view. He gave it, too, the privilege to choose, to take the glory of the rainbow's hues, to wear at morning, and for change delight, the marvelous sunsets of the tropic night. From day to day, behind this rainbowed screen, the father, the inscrutable, unseen, would ponder on his domain of the earth and all the nations he had given birth. And he caused flowers to weave upon the ground their rich embroideries. And he sat around the village where each tribe worked all day long, a veritable tapestry of song from birds that in the branches built their bars and spent within the shade quick musical hours. So every wind blew peace and fortune down from the sweet heavens, and everywhere was sung a song of praise to the great spirit above that fathered them in kindliness and love. And every moon, each tribe would come and float upon the stream a sacrificial boat, new carved and painted, laden with fish and fruit, and watch it gain speed as it neared and shot over the rock into the gorge below. And as the waters, so the centuries flow. Until the savage Karabishi came and put the Patamona to the flame, they came by night and took them in their sleep, slaughtered the guards and drove away the sheep, ravished the women, burnt their huts and fields, despite their war clubs and their wooden shields. A few, the merest remnant, took to flight and under shelter of the friendly night escaped from the pursuing torches sent to slay them in the caches where they went. These took the terrible tidings of the raid to the far camp their restless kin had made on the Pataro. That the feud was awake and counsel what defences they could make. Old Kai was chief in council. He was wise. Over a hundred seasons had those eyes seen in their passage. Time had made them dim, but with its wisdom compensated him. He knew the cures for all men's ills and fears, and he had words for women in their tears to comfort them. He sat all day and talked unto the tribe, for painfully he walked on legs like rotten trunks, wherein chiggers had nested and made caves of all his toes. Just now he counselled. Since our arms are small, I and another to the mountain wall will go to question Machanima's will. What he requires, that we must fulfil in sacrificial offerings. He is kind. His orders will chase fear out of our mind. Then someone murmured, what can Kai's feet stand the troublesome journey through steep, rocky land? Flames sprang to Kai's eyes. Will you never learn from what the mind wills, body will not turn? The next morning laboured up the slope Kai and the one other with their ropes strapped round their backs their bags of magic art, with all the stuff that in their spells had part. Kai's feet off staggered, and the western sun was swallowed up by night. The day was done before they came upon the slab of stone that ends the path to the great spirit's home. Alone, they stood while the vast starry night was full of falling water. 
Kai felt his fellow pull his arm. Look there! Yes, Bakanaima's birds. They are his messengers. They speak his words. These small black cruiser birds, they fly in flocks and feed on lana seed among the rocks. And now the birds made swoopings around the pier and chattering brushed Kai's cheek and kissed his ear. Twice, thrice they did this. And then with sudden flight, they wheeled and veered off through the seeing night. Then, in a voice that swelled and sank and broke with the great wealth of joy he felt, Kai spoke. Oh, great is Machanima and the word that he has spoken by the message of his birds. I must go down the passage of the river that I may sit before his face forever into his great house, the everlasting rock. And he has promised that no harm, no shock shall bruise our people, for his watch and ward shall circle us, and he shall be our God. I am accounted for a sacrifice for all the tribe. You, with your younger eyes, shall see the offering that you may tell how boldly Kai clasped such a death, how well he lost his life to save his threatened race and shadow them with the eternal peace. So in the morning, while the dim mist wreathed and the fall thundered and the deep gorge seethed, that other sat advantage by the wall and scanned the river to the waterfall. He saw the sun or peep the world and throw tide after tide of golden ray and glow against the fall, flood full on its attire, its misty veil, and catch that mist of fire. Amazed, he stared. The opalescent light deepened and sank and changed. Then, in his sight, below the point that Kai had bid him mark, he saw Kai in a sacrificial bark. The frail boat bobbed and bucked within the grip of the live waters that hurried it to the lip over the abyss. Kai then raised his tall, huge bulk in the boat and towered over the fall, a cruciform over the flaming mist. Then, with a force that nothing could resist, the boat rent all that misty veil in two, drawing a dark line down the rainbow hue. But But of Kai's Kai's body never never showed a trace. trace. He He sat sat with With Makanaima before his his face. (laughs) ¶¶ 